Welcome back for our final game of the day, our final game of the week, where Dignitas are looking to close out a 4-0 win streak against the Golden Guardians. Pretty surprising, considering they started off the split 0-8. and eight. It, it yeah. Honestly, I, I don't think anyone was predicting you know, how quickly they could come back, and the fact that they're actually you know in the hunt for playoffs is pretty impressive. They did sub in Viker, Viper to start off this week, and he got his Riven. And honestly, you know, there was a lot of criticism, you know, top of the day from the analyst desk about the fact that the Riven was left open because most people agree Lorlo had been playing well for the squad. So if you're going to sub in Viper, it's probably specifically for a niche pick like this. Everyone knows that he really is the best Riven in the LCS. Uh, they gave it over to him and they were made to regret it. Yeah, as a one trick, whenever people have always asked me, hey, bro, why don't you play Clash? I say it's because of bands. And it turns out when you don't ban the champion that a man is known for, that man can run absolutely crazy all over your entire team. You got to give props to Viper for doing it. We saw the stats earlier today during our Law and Order parody segment where Viper is 6 and 3 on Riven in professional games and 22 and 62 on all other champions combined. Clearly the man stands out particularly on his champion that he built his name off of when he was an amateur like people knew Viper the Riven player. So, we'll see if he ends up getting to play it again today. I would sincerely hope that teams have learned that you got to keep Riven away from this guy. I know people don't like spending bans on off meta champs, but kind of important so yeah we'll see I, mean, I, I think i think at the end of the day you know there's there's more of an argument to not ban it if you're banning other roles if you're going to ban him out which is actually what clg did clg i do believe banned kennen against him right so if you're going to do something against him it should be the ribbon uh that is at the very least true but dick you know is having this resurgence really just in the nick of time because they did start out you know zero and eight they have had to really bounce back and their last three games have been so much more impressive you know the the difference between how they have looked is just enormous. The stats are there to tell the tale. You know, even just the goal difference of 15 shows how much better things are going. They were down over 800 gold on average, now up 500. Their Drake control has gone way up. Their Baron control wasn't even anything, pretty much. In the <laughs> hey, first come on, it was, it was a six. That means they got one Their of them. Their Baron control was one time they got close enough to take a <laughs> screenshot. You know, it was, it was, on, it was <laughs> on their screen. That's a bit what their uh, Baron control was in the first eight games. But they're, they're looking so much better, right? And I think it, it is very impressive to see this, this turnaround. They did make some roster swaps. That is obviously a big part of it. Uh, and I'm interested to see if they can continue this because they can be a dark horse, you know, towards the LCS playoffs. We are in this format in summer where a top eight makes it to playoffs. So it doesn't matter what your record is as long as you get in. It just matters what your current level performance is. And Dignitas right. over the last three games has one of the current highest levels really of, of any of the squads. And on the opposite side of the rift as them, Golden Guardians. And particularly when you look at your watch and look at the mid lane, you know that it's about to be Tanner time. And he has a bone to pick with his former org because we'll see if he can take them down here yet again. The last time that he was victorious against Dignitas, we saw him flash up the emote at the Nexus kill, then tweet ha 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 in all caps on Twitter. And today, <laughs> when the Dignitas org tweeted out who else is gonna go for another for a 2-0 weekend, Tanner commented, not you bro, lol. He's uh, definitely talking some trash, and I am all about it. Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm also very impressed that you had the precise amount of Haas. I'm sure that you know, that was 100 percent <laughs> accurate. You know, I, I wouldn't have oh, been you able know to it. discern between you know the three and the 11 or so Haas that you use. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about accuracy in my reporting here, Isaac. We got to make sure that we're telling the true story mm -hmm. of the teams and the players, and particularly watching Demonte prove to Dig that hey. You should have kept me. I think that's super fun. I think that's super exciting. And we'll see if he can pull it off here in this game as the first ban of the match will be the Azir against Phoenix. I like that ban. Dignitas banning away the TF and Golden Guardians responding with responding with the Graves. Something I was talking about in yesterday's draft is that 
You know, when you have multiple players who are basically screaming, ban this champion, you know, ban one specific champion, it's like, Phoenix, you go up against him, everyone's like, ban Azir or you're trolling. You go up against Viper, ban Riven or you're trolling, right? Well, then there's all these powerful meta picks that you're going to leave open, so you can't always ban everything. Uh, in this case, they are going to leave Riven open. We'll see, you know, if it's even an appropriate draft, if Dignitas has any interest in going towards it. Obviously, he, he, you know, there's many, many, many times where it hasn't actually been banned against him and he doesn't pick it. It's not as though it's a 100% thing and, and you should always ban against him no matter what because Riven can be shut down pretty hard in some matchups. Can also really struggle to team fight against teams that have a lot of easy to land CC because Riven really does depend on the mobility as well as the spamful E shield to survive. Point and click will do the trick when it comes to those hyper mobile champions. Just pick something real easy, lock Lulu. them down with. But uh, Golden Guardians, they're starting off here with the Olaf in the jungle for closer. Olaf doesn't get through against a lot of these different teams because it is such a monstrous champion. You can run over the early game, farms at such a, a frantic rate, and is able to solo up dragons incredibly easily. Things like Yui are still available, so if they wanted to go for that, that is an option. Wukong going to get locked in here. We have seen Wukong played in three roles in the LCS. Dardoch actually the only one to have played it on Dignitas, and he is actually the only jungler to have played it in the LCS, but we have seen it in a, in a bot lane situation alongside Senna. We've obviously seen it top a number of times, so that is definitely a flex. We know that Phoenix is going to be playing the Zoe, though. Phoenix on Zoe, Wukong also picked up. Two of those champions that just drive people crazy playing against them with what sort of things they can pull off with Wukong's double ultimates and Zoe's damage from so far away. But Ooh. the response from Golden Guardians is going to be Old Faithful there in Ezreal. Thinking about a couple of different things here as that third pick, and they'll go with Galio. Galio works very nicely here. You know, it's always good to have a mid laner that has relatively strong wave clear and can actually move to help out Olaf. Olaf wants to be fighting the other jungler, wants to have a mid laner that can back him up. So Kogma coming through here, I'm, I'm assuming that this is still Kogma bot. We have seen Zoe very rarely, like G2 has done this in the past, played played as a bot lane farmer. Uh, but I am expecting this to actually just be Kogma bot, played as more of a standard marksman and Zoe mid, unless they want to get really crazy. Uh, it's pretty pretty wild comp though, uh, honestly, already for Dignitas. The only thing I care about, Isaac, is that they use the Kogma skin again. After the last game, I could use another 30 or 40 minutes on the rift with everybody's favorite lizard wizard. Hopefully I get it. Hopefully I get it. I'll just have to be patient and see. You but got a real band away. Hey, Riven band away. Congratulations, Golden Guardians. A plus on the exam. If you're banning out top laners against Viper, you got to ban the Riven away. And there you go. More top lane focus coming out from the side of Dignitas now as Camille and Malphite are both banned out. And that leads me to also believe that the Wukong is going top. Malphite is one of the rougher matchups for Wukong if played correctly. So they want to keep that one out of the game. And Thresh will be the final ban here for the Golden Guardians. Yeah, Malphite is really tough for a lot of the melee AD champions. It's actually really tough for Riven as well. So that does get banned out. And Hauntzer, while he hasn't played Malphite, is really, really flexible. This guy has been playing you know, a different champion almost every single game. So you would have to believe that he could bring that out. With Trundle coming through, you're expecting this to be Trundle Jungle, Wukong top. Still looking like it should be that Kog'Maw in the Marksman role and have Zoe played in mid lane. I like Trundle against Olaf, too, because of the way that Olaf uses the Ragnarok and loses his bonus resistances. Mm -hmm. If Trundle ults Olaf right before he Ragnaroks, you can actually get even more bonus taken away, right? Because you're sapping a percentage of the larger armor in MR. It's sort of like a baby version of ulting Sejuani when she has Frost Armor and Aftershock. But Yumi picked up for the Golden Guardians. We're going to see, remember, the champion has been nerfed. It does have substantially higher mana costs that are based on a percent of maximum mana now for the heal. And Kennen will be the final pick here for Golden Guardians. That one in the top side. Kennen and Galio wombo combo for initiation, Azale, is very scary stuff. It is terrifying if they can get in on you. Olaf plus Yumi, also a really strong duo there. You know, to be able to group up. Ezreal is so easy to leave alone. You know, and, and this can even be a decent lane because you have a fair amount of poke. Cog Lulu is, is pretty terrifying, though. I'm going to be interested to see what, what sort of runes and, and masteries they actually do go. I like the barrier on the Kog'Maw and the heal on the Lulu because you've got to be able to keep this Kog'Maw alive through the initial burst. I will say, though, 
it doesn't feel like Wukong fits their composition. That's that's kind of the odd man out here. It right. feels like you have Zoe to poke, and you know you have the Trundle and the Lulu to kind of peel and, and keep this Kogma safe as you you know kite back and whatnot. Wukong feels a little bit random in there, but maybe the idea is just you poke them down and then Wukong flies in and softens them up and you kind of chase forward. Uh, we'll see yeah. if that is able to work because you obviously can use wild growth and everything offensively as well. Yeah, and if they are trying to go in and dogpile on top of Kog'Maw, then Wukong can be very disruptive in stopping them from being able to work together like that. We've seen Wukong particularly be able to buy a lot of time. If the front line is diving in, if Kennen and Galio want to go in there together, probably with Yumi attached to one of them trying to dive towards Kog and Zoe and kill them off, Wukong can then 1v2 the remaining players on the side of Golden Guardians, jump in there and try to keep these guys occupied, spinning around, using the clone to buy some time. The champion is very effective at that so I am curious to see how they're going to use it particularly with this comp because I agree I don't think it fits into generally what you see when you see Kog'Maw Lulu you think of a very specific type of composition yeah. Wukong often doesn't fit the bill but I do want to see what the intended plan here is because I think he can be a really good disruptor he can, and and they might be able to make it fit. Uh, it's just my kind of concern after having a look at the draft. Right. It feels like more you would think, okay, you want more of like a standard front to back style team fight, right? Because that's kind of how Zoe generally works. That's how Kogma generally works. Even Trundle works that way. Uh, so Wukong's not going to have any die buddy. He may be able to be disruptive enough on his own, but is in a fairly tough matchup, especially early on against the Kennen. These melee versus range matchups can be difficult. So if you're put behind and you don't synergize well with your comp, could be a potential problem at the same time. On the other side, you know, there, there's a tremendous amount of dive, right? You obviously want to be flanking with this cannon. You want to send in the Olaf with the Yumi, speeding them up. Galio ults on top, and you're slamming down and hopefully immediately taking out the Kogma and the Zoe. And I think that's going to kind of be the, the key to victory for that squad. Can the Blitz find the valuable targets before they're able to use those defensive tools to survive? That's the name of the game here, right? And I particularly want to see how well this Olaf is utilized because you talked about how we often see the champions banned away from the top teams because they respect how much it's able to control the early game and the mid game. And my question is, we've seen Closer in particular be a catalyst for Golden Guardian's success in the past. Can he do it here on this champion and facilitate early Drake control, early river control, invading, setting up opportunities for his lanes to have priority and make moves? I want to see this guy pop off on this pick. Yep, and we are into game, so we'll find out if he's going to be able to do it. He has been really good at getting leads on a lot of champions. Not always the best uh, when he plays those more early game focused champions at closing the game. But I, I do think the fact that he has Yumi means that you don't have to close the game as early, right? You know, mm -hmm. that's one of the really nice things about this pairing is that it gives more life to that Olaf pick. You can play it into the late game. You can still have success in the late game because of all the added healing and speed and the root that is actually there from that Yumi ultimate. Also, we get the Kog'Maw skin that I wanted. I noticed that as we were looking through our dynamic camera angles loading into the game here. <laughs> that was the one thing I was looking it's for. That's all you're checking for. Else. Yeah, that's like everybody else walking out. I was like, okay, I don't really care if they're doing line of scrimmage or if we're going to have a full five-man on five-man team fight here at level one. I just want to see if we have the Lizard Wizard, and we do. So he's back into the game. Lethal tempo on him this time around. It is your typical marksman-style Kog'Maw as opposed to that AP mid-style that we saw in the previous game. Heal on him, exhaust on the Lulu, particularly concerned about making sure they shut down some of the damage potential of either the Olaf or the Kennen when they go in and try to initiate onto him. You can see heal exhaust both onto who he's Yumi as well. Sometimes we see Yumi's take Ignite if they want to be a little bit more aggressive, but not this time around. Teleports on three out of four of the solo laners here this time around. Phoenix is opting for the cleanse over the teleport here on his Zoe, and there is a summoner's spellbook there on both Kennen and Galio. Both solo laners of Golden Guardians will have the opportunity to switch those spells around, and we'll see how creative they can get with those this game. It is interesting to note that there's no Relic Shields taken down in the bottom lane. You know, that is by far the most common option these days. People often find it too hard to consistently keep that Spell Thieves on cooldown, and if you're not always getting that poke out, you just get much better gold generation. You know, from having that Relic Shield, it's pretty much guaranteed you're always going to have the ability to proc it. So this, this is a little bit of a trade-off. You know, you get the extra mana regen, which is really nice, because Yumi and Lulu can both be very mana-hungry. But we'll have to track how late they actually do complete that support item because it really can delay the completion of that, that Scythe Stone and being able to have those wards can mean a lot. 
Checking in on where the junglers started here real quick. It looks like both junglers are working towards the bottom side of the map here. Dardok going from his red buff straight into the bottom half of the map, making sure that he secures that top side valuable camp before leaving that area in case Closer wanted to do some kind of jungle invade early on. But now Dardok will head towards that top side river. He's in really good shape. Trundle can clear through these camps in a super healthy state. And Olaf likes to get low HP just to make sure he's speeding up the clear. Let's see if Dardok can make a gank happen here onto DeMonte. Phoenix could seek out that sleepy trouble oh, bubble. Nice, nice use of the pillar. DeMonte flashing out to keep himself safe. That was perfectly timed there by Dardok, waiting for that uh, charge back from the Galio. He always swoops back before he actually punches forward. So you can actually end up getting further away from your destination if you're immediately interrupted on that pullback. So nicely timed pillar does force out the flash. And that's going to be pretty good from them. This, this clear from Closer was actually so fast, though. He did full clear and scuttle by about 3.30. So, you know, seven camps essentially done already at this point in the game, if you're counting that scuttle. And he's going to be back for an early base. He grabs up that chilling smite. So that allows you to have much more of a, an effect in these early games. Uh, you do have the opportunity to then try to chase people down if they're out of position. It makes your ganks so much more effective. Right. He went for a better early path, more efficient, more potentially risky because he got so low HP to speed up that clear pattern. And the cost was his opponent was able to get the flash out of his mid laner there in DeMonte. So can Dignitas make use of that here over the course of the next three and a half minutes or so and come back for a return gank onto DeMonte to really make use of blowing that summoner spell? Or will Closer's nice farm pattern pay off and allow him to hit that level six fast enough to really force the issue here in a couple of minutes? We will find out. It is a gold lead here early on for the Golden Guardians just based on farm alone. But when you have a cannon lane, when you have an Ezreal, I would expect your team to be able to farm up very effectively in the laning phase. Phoenix gets a little bit of damage down onto DeMonte there. Not a whole ton. It's not like he's really worried. Phoenix is completely out of mana. And DeMonte can just clear the rest of the wave away as Johnson and Aphromoo are getting pretty familiar with the scenery underneath this tier <laughs> one turret, but they're fine to farm up. Cog Lulu is not the early game menace. They are all about that scaling. You are scaling always when you're playing this style of bot lane. So as long as they're farming out, as long as they're not getting bullied too hard or losing the turret, you can be pretty happy about your situation. And the other thing is, while it's very limited windows of power, you still have to respect the damage that can come out from Cog Lulu. You know, if you shift forward haphazardly or something like that, it's so easy to proc the lethal tempo with your E, you just goop them up, and then you, you, with your W active and the lethal tempo proc, you get sped up by the Lulu. Your attack speed is pretty ridiculous, and the damage output can be very high. Uh, so there can be you know, these moments of a lot of power, like even that trade right there. It's right. just few and far between because the cooldown's quite long in the early game, and you know, you're know you very reliant on it. Dignitas continuing to just play this game however they want. While Golden Guardians did go for the early first Drake, it was not contested and an easy pickup there for them. Mountain Drake under their belt. Infernal Drake will be spawning next. It means we get either Cloud or Ocean Soul this game. We know how valuable Ocean Soul is to literally everyone, but Cloud Soul is the one that people usually look at as the most situational, right? Some champions get a lot of use out of it. Other champions are like, what the hell is this even for? When I look at an Olaf and a Kinnon, I see a couple of champions that can get a lot of use out of a Cloud Soul. They really can. That is, is honestly terrifying when, when you think about those style of champions with it. I would also say Wukong, incredible with it. And, and, as, and as funny as this may sound, it's actually really good for Kog'Maw because you get not only the flat 10% move speed, but your ultimate almost becomes a defensive at that point. You know, you yeah. pop your ultimate and you get this massive boost of move speed. You have the 10% flat, then you get the 30 or so uh, that you do for actually proccing the ultimate. And all of a sudden, you know, Olaf and Kennen, these champions that are trying to close on you, have to walk through your goof, which is you being slowed down, and you have an enormous burst of speed to either chase down or kite back. Nice damage there coming out from Phoenix. I thought for sure the minion was going to step up and block that one in time, but the AoE of the Paddle Star just barely big enough to make sure that it hit the champion instead. Closer invading for the second red buff of Dardoch. Haunts are coming to collapse, and they force the flash away from the Dignitas jungler. However, because of the fact that Phoenix is heading over, that's the only victory Golden Guardians are going to find here, and Closer has to leave or risk the three-man punish. 
Intelligent Flash by Dardock, you know, you can't really mess around with that level 6 Olaf because if you get too low, he can even just flash follow over that wall and finish you off. But good collapse does mean he is protected somewhat. And, and despite the fact that Olaf is going to have a much faster clear, yes, Closer did take the dragon, but Dardock has stayed relevant. He forced the flash mid lane. He's keeping up in farm pretty well. Uh, can be, I think, fairly happy about how the early game has gone, you know, given the lanes. You have Olaf and a Trundle, you're expecting to be behind there, you're expecting the cannon to be ahead in the top lane, and you're expecting your bot lane to be uh, behind as well. So, you know, Dignos has some losing lanes, but they're, they're within striking distance. Blue buff also handed off there to Phoenix to make sure he's able to keep the spam going there in mid lane. It's always a good feeling as a mid laner when you feel like you've Ran completely out of mana, otherwise you would have to go back, but the blue buff saves the day and makes it so you don't have to give up that lane control here just yet. Johnson and Aphromoo looking for maybe a chance to make something happen with Dardock down here in the bottom lane. FBI knows better than to step up when they're not aware of where the trundle could be. You can see some question mark pings coming out there from the side of Golden Guardians in that bottom side river saying, hey, we think Dardock could be around, don't risk it for a little bit of turret damage. It's a good job just kind of being aware of their surroundings and, and knowing their limits in that situation. It's always tempting to try to push in and try to harass and try to deny some of the farm there, but they had a good reset timing anyway, so it's not like they're losing a lot from backing off. They go back, they have tier, they already got a call on an early base, so it you know, has the pieces of that Muramana and is going to be pretty happy about the situation they're sitting in, but Afro and Johnson, because they were covered on that push from Dardoch, they're going to be able to reset the wave, and you know, with with this early cut list that Johnson has, you can start to really start shrugging off a lot of the poke that is going to come out from FBI and Hootie, and this lane can start going more in their favor. Rift Herald now being taken by Closer. Shouldn't be any interference from this one. There's no Blast Cone available for the Dignitas jungle, so I don't think Dardoch will have any real chance to get in there, considering there's no Flash either. Even if he went in there and then tried to get out, he wouldn't be able to, so it's not really worth the risk. Now, where does Closer want to use the Herald? We will have to find out. Remember, you got four minutes to use it, and considering he picked it up at nine and a half, that means that plates will be standing all the way through that duration. So any use of it to get plates at all is going to be oh. good money here for the Golden Guardians as Phoenix can't quite find the distance there on the Paddle Star. Demonte doing a good job buffering the Justice Punch to get maximum possible distance away from Phoenix and make him actually lose out on the trade a little bit by taking a turret shot for no reason. Even even with that, it looked like it was a pixel or two out of range. That was so close to actually connecting there. And nice little ultimate from FBI, just trying to poke them down. But you know, as I said, now that Johnson has some of this life steal built up, as long as he's not getting hit by every bit of poke, he's going to be pretty comfortable sitting in this situation. And Afro move becomes more of the target. You know, it kind of switches from the Kogma who you want to keep down early to this Lulu who doesn't have that sustain, being the one that you're really looking to punish. Closer investing in clearing some vision away from the mid lane and also summoning up the Rift Herald, recognizing that Phoenix is gone. This is not a maximum efficiency Rift Herald where you try to drop it with either two or three plates remaining and just get the most value possible. Instead, this is a get money onto my mid laner quickly, make sure that we get that immediate payoff and see if we can translate that into more later on. Golden Guardians also picking up their second Drake of the game. Ocean Soul yet again, lo-fi hip-hop rift to study and gank lanes to, super relaxing, very zen, all the best types of things to keep you level-headed playing through this game. I love this rift. I get Magical Kog'Maw on my favorite rift. This is a good game. This is a great way to end week six, Isaac. It's honestly the perfect Kog'Ma rift as well, right? Because really all you want to do is chill and farm. You're not trying to do yes. anything <laughs> until maybe like, you know, 30 minutes later. So it's, it's not chill and study. It's just chill and CS, man. You're just hanging <laughs> out, you know, you're enjoying the brushes, enjoying all the flowers everywhere, getting all well, the cannon minions. Life is good for the Kog'Ma. More brushes to juke into when all those other champions <laughs> try to run you down and kill you all the time. It's good times here for uh, for the little Kog'Maw. But things continue to build there in terms of neutral objectives for the Golden Guardians. They have had complete control over those so far. I said back in Champ Select that that's what I wanted to see out of this Olaf. I wanted to see Closer control the neutral game, make sure he was really taking advantage of how strong Olaf is in these 1v1s. And so far, he's two for two on Drakes. He got that first Herald as well that gave Demonte some extra gold. He's doing what I want to see him do. He really is, and, and I'm becoming more and more concerned just about how the top lane is actually going for Dignitas. You know, I, I called it out in draft. I didn't really think that the, the Wukong kind of fit their comp. Uh, he is falling very far behind. You know, this is like a 40 CS lead. 
He hasn't actually been ganked. I mean, I guess there, it, that Olaf was up there a little bit, so there's maybe some, some modicum of pressure, but it's not as though he's actually been attacked whatsoever by the jungler. And, and you're falling really, really far behind. I, I don't think that it's going to be very easy for this Wukong, who's, who's being held down to find a lot of success. He may prove me wrong, but I definitely have a lot of concerns about how the game is going here for Viper on Wukong. Yep, has the Mercury Treads, has just a Sheen, so not exactly a massive threat to a back line if he's able to engage there, particularly an Ezreal that can have a Yumi attached to keep him healthy and allow him to kite away from that Wukong who he on the Yumi when we're looking at his inventory right now. Doesn't really have a lot that he's working with. A couple of fairy charms, a potion. Now upgrading that into the chalice to make sure the mana regeneration is there. And regeneration will be the name of the game because for those of you who missed the memo, Yumi does have a significant nerf on the mana cost of her healing now. It costs 15% of her maximum mana. So there's no way that you can just build a ton of mana items and essentially alleviate the cost of that. You are going to feel that threat over the course of a team fight if it goes on for too long and who he will have to pick and choose where and when he wants to use those heals. As Dignitas are invading, but they just get down some vision. They won't be aware that Closer is farming up the Krugs and no fights to be seen just yet. 13 and a half minutes into the game, still no kills. Got a banger stat here for you, Flowers. So that Oh, what do we latest, got, my friend? Latest first blood this split was 1318. So you guessed it, buddy. Oh, we're, we're for man. A three. <laughs> this is indeed a record breaker, a barn burner, a lesson learner, whatever you want to call it. We are truly entering new territory here today. Viper gets ignited, but he's not in any danger of being killed off just yet either. Okay. All right, Isaiah, we're going to play the guessing game. Well, okay. Take a guess. What minute will the first death be in? Uh, it's going to be at the next dragon fight, so I'm guessing uh, 16. Okay, so somewhere between 16 and 17. Okay, so somewhere when the clock says 16 something is going to be the first death yep. of the game. All right, yep. all right. Let's see if the literal world champion's prediction capabilities are on point, or if these players will manage to bamboozle him out of that. As Demonte ends up losing a chunk of his HP there to the proto belt active that Phoenix had picked up off the ground. You know, sometimes I get confused when I look at Zoe. I'm like, oh, Proto Belt, that's an interesting tech choice. We don't normally see Zoe's take. Oh, wait, never mind, it's Zoe. And then you just understand that it was not actually that ever, and she just picked it up off the ground. This, however, I don't even remember. How long ago did Zoe release, Isaac? Like, oh, God. A year, a year two time, years time, I'm always so bad with these. I'm like, it was two weeks ago, and they're like, that was seven years ago. Yeah. Also, especially during quarantine, I feel like, you know, last week was five years ago, so I can't really yeah. tell anything. But however long ago Zoe came out. decades have passed in 2020. Yeah, I still have. I'm still not used to watching Zoe pick up random crap off the ground and just throw it all over the place. At so. least you can't get teleported anymore. That was the worst. Yes, that was the worst thing ever. Being able to pick up teleport and go, well, I win lane. Like, see, that's where we needed pros being able to use <laughs> emotes in game, is when they could be Zoe, pick up teleport off the ground, up. and go, well, I won lane, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, that would have been the ultimate time for the thumbs up. That's when I really wanted to see that. We missed out on prime BM time. True. All right, so here, here. <laughs> you know, I was talking about the choice of the Spell Thieves versus the Relic Shield early on. Afro still doesn't have his actually converted over. The average conversion time throughout the LCS this split is 1023. So that just gives you an example of how much slower this can be. You know, you, you can say that, oh, maybe you should have done a better job of it or whatever, but it's it's really hard to actually consistently proc it without taking too much damage. And we may not even get a, a fight. It looks like Dignitas isn't even moving. So they're just going to give up the third. So I was wrong, I think, on the 16 oh, no. minute first blood. I, I was expecting that they wouldn't be willing to put themselves at soul point. Yes, you have good scaling. Uh, I guess it's, it's a hard call to make, you know, but if, if they're just saying, all right, Wukong needs at least Triforce before we can fight, you know, Kogwa needs at least two items before we can fight, we don't have a chance, then okay. If you if you don't have a chance, you don't have a chance, right? And you have to have to give that up. But then I start to really question what your, your draft is actually doing here, where, you know, you're sitting back in this spot where you've, you've lost a turret, you're down three and a half thousand gold, and you're at sole point before contesting anything. Like, Yes, you might be able to theoretically stop every dragon for the rest of the game and then win, but it's it's not as though Golden Guardians just have a trash comp later on. Like, you know, Olaf Yumi has has relevance into the late game, and and I do think that Kogma is going to be fairly susceptible to the dives until you get to like 
way into the luxury items, right? Where you have multiple defensive items and stuff where you can't just get one shot. Look at that oof of a gold graph there on the left side of the screen. Phoenix just barely moving past closer. And if not for that, it would have been all Golden Guardians players there at the very top before you got into any of the Dignitas players. When Golden Guardians jungler is more wealthy than Dignitas' AD carry, there's a little bit of a problem here moving forward. Now, as you've said, you know, if Kog'Maw gets six items, doesn't really matter anyway. He pukes all over the entire team. He just kills everybody at once. It's not that big of a deal. But we're a long way away from that point of the game. We are only yeah. just now about at 18 minutes, and Golden and Guardians is looking real good. You know, my, my biggest concern is, is actually, like, that they, they're probably not even going to have Rage Blade by the time they have to fight for Soul. Right. And yeah, and I would get it more if it's like, OK, you know, you're going to be on this really, really powerful point, because when, when you have Blade of the Rune King and Rage Blade, you actually don't need six items on Kong'Maw. Like that alone is going to give you enough damage as long as you don't instantly die to just blast through a single target. Right. And then when you hit three items with, with Hurricane and stuff, that can be you know, even more potential damage. But they're so far away from that. Afro just now actually got the, the transform on his on his spell thieves. So, you know, right around 18 minutes when, when the average time, you know, is 10, they're not contesting anything anyway, so I guess the vision didn't really matter. But I do think that uh, like, I, was, I wasn't playing I'm actually. <laughs> Look, I, I know it but, wasn't supposed to be flame. But it, it kind of is, yeah. It, it kind of it comes across as flame when it's like, well, at least if there's going to be a game where you don't have wards in time, it should be a game where you don't need them anyway because well, you're not playing. Well, the team playing. didn't buy items, like, but they're not doing yeah. anything anyway. So, so really. it's not like you need them, I mean. Yeah. When you're just farming minions. It says real is 0-16, but even if he was six items, he hasn't hit a skill shot, so who can know? But, right, um, exactly. When you're shooting minions, mystic shot's a mystic <laughs> shot. But I, either way, I, I think that the thing is, you're missing out on a, a lot of gold generation, right? Because it's the same amount of gold generation to actually, uh, you know, gold earned to complete your spell thieves as it is for Relic Shield. And and when the average is around 10-ish 10, 10 minutes, that means that that gold is very delayed, right? You know, you're getting to that, that thousand gold mark where it turns off so much later into the game. So, you know, the support's going to be more poor. Kog'Maw's far off being relevant. Triforce is just now finished, and it is very late because uh, Viper is, is not in a fun lane um, so they've kind of just, just oh. bet their their whole game on being able to win every team fight from now until infinity and and I'm not sure that they can really guarantee that yeah also when you look at Kennen double spell pen proto belt yeah and he Zero should MR be in a spot to uh, even if he doesn't have the fully completed Zonia's hourglass I would expect him to be able to just get the one and done stopwatch mm -hmm. for the for the fight at the Drake and so then you're you're Kennen, you're living the dream, man. You're able to go in, you have full initiation power, and you have a stopwatch to keep yourself alive after you go. That's ideal. Yep. So I'm wondering really, like, can Dig even try to fight this? I mean, Dardoch's inventory, he doesn't have a second item fully completed after the Cinder Hulk, so the Trundle's not particularly strong right now either. Phoenix still working towards getting that second full item done after the Luden's Echo. Why when you look at Demonte, Remember the other big thing about building Proto Belt? It's cheap compared to other big mage items, right? It only costs 2,500, 2,600 gold. So you can get that and a second item done much more quickly. Proto Belt plus Zonia's Hourglass completed for Demonte there on the Galio. The Drake spawning in 30 seconds. It's Dignitas with control over the bottom river. But can they yeah. make it happen? Yeah, I mean, Afro doesn't even have his, his first uh, item completed. You know, the Zeke's isn't done on Dardoch. You're going all in on the Kog'Maw, but you don't have the pieces set up. Rageblade isn't done. You know, they, they have to, though. They have no choice anymore because if you give up Soul at this point in the game, it's probably just over. But I think any reasonable fight from Golden Guardians, as long as Hauntzer actually can swap over to Flash here with his Spellbook, it's like... Olaf, Galio, and Kennen all flashed on top of the Kogma with Yumi attached to one of them. I just don't see how Kogma ever lives, but we'll see. Oh, here goes Demonte already into the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see some kills. It's closer on the board. First and foremost, a double kill over to the Olaf as Viper tries to spin to win in the middle of the fight, but the blender will not be successful. Golden Guardians pick up three plush and Ocean Soul. Where is the hope for Dignitas when the first fight of the game comes 22 minutes in and it goes like that? I'm gonna be honest. This game was absolutely terrible from Dignitas. This is just this is like a horrible, horrible game. You, you didn't do anything the whole game, and that is what you're betting your game on. There was just like 
almost no way in which they could even win that fight. And if you're checkmated this hard, it's like, yes, it was a great flank. Yes, Devante got that. But Hauntzer wasn't even there, and you already lost the fight. It's not as though it was close. Hauntzer didn't even have to alter do anything. He wasn't even a part yeah. of it. Like, it, it's just, it's disappointing to see a team, you know, concede so much. Uh, I don't think the Wukong fit. You you automatically lose multiple lanes here in this draft. You have no pressure as a result as your jungler. Your options are so limited, and it just feel like they absolutely checkmated themselves with their own draft. So, all right, let's... This will probably be the last time at the game I'm even able to pose this kind of a question. What's the play for Dig uh, Toss? I mean, the play is, is wait and pray. Like, the play is actually just, okay, we're scaling, right? Like, buy every support item in the game, get Night Vow and Zeke's on Trundle, get, you know, Redemption and Arden Sensor and, like, every single thing on your Lulu. Hope that Johnson can get really, you know, deep into his item build and that the game isn't over by then. And, and if you can get to that point where Kog'Maw is just insta-killing, you know, the Olaf and, and whatnot, then, then maybe there's some hope. But I think that when you're this behind, you have to get past just the damage items now, and you have to get to all the luxury items for Johnson to even have a chance of, of surviving. Okay, let's see what you can do, little lizard wizard. You know that I, I think that that skin's cute as hell, but I don't think that's enough to come back at a game like this. 7,000 gold down, Ocean Soul in the possession of their opponents. FBI got hit by some Zoe damage, but it was immediately healed up by the Yumi as soon as his health bar took a hit. It went right back up. Haunter's pressuring the top lane tier two. He's 70 CS ahead of his counterpart in Viper on this Wukong. Yep. I I'm mean, and they, they have Ocean Soul, so it's like, you can just stand in their jungle forever. You're never going to run out of mana. The, the mana limitations on Yumi are relevant. They're relevant on everyone. And you can start Baron up a thousand times if you want, because you just heal off of Baron, because you're proccing the Ocean Soul. So Dignitas is now going to be forced to face check over and over and over and over and over. And, you know, Golden Guardians has the ability to just finish this or to hard commit and force them to actually come over and fight. I don't think Dignitas really feels comfortable at all to even make a move over to try to fight. So they're just seeding the Baron as well. Um, they know they can't fight it, but it's like, you know, at, at what point is this game supposed to turn around then? Are, are you now right. praying as Dignitas that you're, you know, you, you last 20 more minutes? Is it 25 more minutes? You know, you're down almost almost 10,000 gold, and, and you're hoping that somehow the game is going to go twice as long, or maybe even longer, before you're relevant. I just... I, I feel like they're already... Dignitas is completely irrelevant at this state of the game. They, they've yeah. not taken a stand for anything. They, they contested one neutral objective throughout the entirety of the whole game. They have one turret that they just managed to pick up there down in the bottom lane thanks to Viper. It just seems like they showed up and didn't play. I'm, yeah, I'm really I mean, I just, concerned as to what the plan was here. I, I just really hate the draft so much. It's so bad. Like I, I think that it's one of those situations where, you know, I pointed out the Wukong draft. I pointed out the Wukong when he was down in 40 DPS. What has the Wukong done for you at, at any point of this game, right? You know, and, and that's not even attacking Viper, that's just attacking the, the pick here. I think right. you know, you can't just see all your lanes, right? Like you can't go Lulu Cog and then also like counter you know, ha have like a counter pick for yourself on the top lane. You know, you have to be willing to flex things around and, and give Viper a better setup or protect him better. You know, because if you're if you're just auto losing both top and bot and the other team has Olaf. Well, now your Trundle can't do anything either. So now you've given up, you know, three uh, three areas of the map essentially entirely. And Zoe into Galio is like at best, you know, kind of even-ish. And there's the ability uh, for Demonte to make more plays around the map. So it just feels like uh, Dignitas didn't really leave themselves any options at all. And as a result, like this is the game we get. Okay, uh, another question for you then. Let's play another guessing game. Okay. Will Dignitas fight at all? before the fight that ends the game? Um, so uh, another way to put it is... Probably not. Will Actually, probably not, no. I th I, the that's next, my guess. Yeah, the next Dignitas death timer that happens, will the Nexus blow up before that person comes back? Oh, I mean, maybe not, because maybe someone dies like on, on these inhibs. But I, but I think that if you're willing to give up you know, give up Baron and, and everything, you have totally committed to like, okay, God, just pray that we can, we can farm it out. Pray that we can somehow last you know, really, really, really long time. Um, so I think, you know, as a result, you're going to be willing to, to give up anything that isn't completely lethal damage in the game, uh, which generally means they're probably going to have to fight whenever they're they're losing like their third inhib or their nexus turrets or something. Uh, and, and I just can't see them being in a position to win that fight.
Johnson lost half his HP to True Shot Barrage. Mystic Shot's following it up, nearly take him down. He has the Rage Blade now, but it's too little, way too late. Golden Guardians have already taken the first inhibitor. They are on to the second. Kiana Giggle Emote, same, bro. As Dignitas tries to get themselves away, Golden Guardians continue the push. Dignitas has no avenue to fight this whatsoever. They are down 10,500 gold. Nexus turret number one under fire. Stand. They've got two of those cannon minions already shooting at him. Demonte has the BM ready to go. Johnson gets a little bit of damage there on the closer, but remember, the Ocean Soul will help keep these guys topped off in terms of their HP. Phoenix tries to find a paddle star to follow up that trouble bubble there, but he will not be able to hit the mark. Wukong's coming around from behind. Viper wants the flank. This could be their only chance. Phoenix jumps over the wall for a little bit of damage. Viper continuing to try to run away. Galio goes for the taunt, but Demonte's CC will not find its marker here just yet. Viper now locked down, now forced out of the fight. The wild growth to keep him alive as Hauntzer goes in, and Viper is dead. Aphromu tries to keep himself as far away from these Golden Guardians players as humanly possible. TP coming in onto the minion here to get everybody from Golden Guardians right back into the enemy base. One Nexus turret between them and their final objective here as Johnson tries to hold the line, spitting out some of those auto attacks. The attack speed is impressive. Finding some damage there onto Hauntzer, but not enough to really put him under any real threat. FBI again going to be healed back up to full thanks to the Yumi of Huhi. Dardock tries to get himself away. Demonte once again going to be looking for the taunt. It's over. That's all she wrote. 4-0 to zero final score. Golden Guardians win the easiest game of their lives. Oof. That's all there is to say. I mean, Dignitas never contested a thing. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm really disappointed with Dignitas. Uh, the, the Wukong made no sense. I, I I think I think that they just they just gave up way too much, you know, in in their draft as far as laning power, and and they weren't really even attempting. It's like, you know, it, it's one of those situations where that that felt like almost a classic example of, of playing not to lose, right? Where you're saying yeah. at all all times of the game where you're like, okay, you know, we have weaker champions at this point in the game. We can't we can't fight. Um, you know, we have uh, a disadvantage. We're pushed in here, so let's not contest that. Um, and, and when you get too far into that mindset, you're overlooking the fact that if you're doing nothing, you're essentially just guaranteeing you lose, right? So sometimes even if you have a, a smaller chance to win that you would like, you know, even if it's, say, 40-60 or 30-70, if that's better than your overall chance to win the game otherwise, you still need to go for that, right? Yeah. And they did at Lesser least two attempt. Evils. Yeah, exactly. They did at least attempt to fight at Seoul, but uh, they just gave up way too much. They didn't contest anything, and they weren't even close to getting to, to the items that they really need to get. So uh, I'm very disappointed uh, in Dignitas from that game. I'm sure they're disappointed in themselves as well, but especially because they've actually looked good, right? So that, that's right. why I'm kind of like, what happened? This was just a disastrous game because they had three games in a row where they actually looked really good with this new roster, and they it felt like they were really turning around. So um, we'll see if this is just a blip in the radar or if it's uh, going to be more, more of this from Dignitas. Yeah, we came into the game today talking about how this team started off 0-8 and eight and since then had gone 3-0. and zero. If they managed to win this game, that was going to be back-to-back -back weekends that were nothing but wins, and that was looking really cool for this squad. But this game just completely was off every mark. So Dignitas unfortunately meets with tragedy, and Golden Guardians showed that when their opponents aren't going to contest anything, they will end the game rather swiftly. So we're heading into a quick break. On the other side of that break, we will break down the match with our analysts. Don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Hello and welcome to the Bud Light Breakdown, where we just witnessed Golden Guardians dismantle Dignitas. Mark, wake up, buddy. Mark. <laughs> oh, Mark. Are hey, we back? Mark. Yeah. Hey, we're, we're I'm back, ready. Buddy. Game's I'm over, buddy. Game's over. You missed a you missed a doozy. Great yeah. game. Uh, Dardoch yeah. was really aggressive. I liked the, the, all the fighting. Uh, There's there was a lot of kills, right? <laughs> ah, there were so many kills, Mark, and we're gonna get to those in just a moment. But we got to talk about the tools that these teams drafted on their way in. Now, in all seriousness, there was some there was some creativity pulled out in this draft by other teams. Yeah, I mean, I I do like a lot of these picks in isolation, right? Cog Lulu's really cool. I'm still a fan of Wukong. I like the Monte on Galio, but. Focusing a bit more on uh, Dignitas' composition, I mean, Aphromu and Dardoch are their playmakers. Those are the clutch players. Those are the ones who start all the fights. And in this game, they have Trundle and Lulu. So if you could guess, neither of them made any plays because those champions have no agency. And I mean, if you want to add on to it, they're like, they kind of have a losing top, losing bot, and weirdish kind of mid lane. So the lane pressure early game is not great. And then the only one on the team who can initiate is Viper who's, like, the newest addition, like, he can't have that much responsibility. Like, where's my, well, yo, Afro hooks? It's because you just played the Wukong this early, and you just ran you ran the draft into the ground. Orin's still up. <laughs> Could have just played Orin, right? Could have just had a nice and easy game, just have a way to fight him. But no, I said, we're going to play it back. We're going to dial back the aggression, guys. We were too <laughs> aggro last said. time. Well, we I need to be more controlled. I just don't understand. Yeah, like, what is the Wukong going to do in this this game? He's not a great frontliner. You have a clear poke comp. Okay, you already have the trundle for frontlining. But then, like, if the Wukong ever goes in, how are they going to kill anything unless the Wukong's so far ahead he can 100 to 0 by himself? Or, like, a single AD Kogma R is going to finish the guy off? Like, yeah, it, I, mean, I. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, please cut me off. Okay, I'm, I'm cutting <laughs> you off. Be, stop talking about Kogma. Who cares? Actually, Crumbs, that fourth pick. Because they had Wukong as a flex, right? We've seen Dardoch play in the jungle before. He could yeah. take it, and that would give him the agency. They did have the Orin fourth pick to keep Wukong as the flex. This gives you two meaty boys, and then you still get your Cog Lulu if you really don't want Aphromoo to win you the game, and you just want him to speed up Johnson, then you could still do that, and the comp would be better, too. Misplay in the draft. Misplay in the draft. But that's all right, because the teams are going to pilot this one. So strap in, boys, because we're about to go through every single piece of action that this game delivered. I hope you're ready. Start to finish. Uh, this is actually really good from the Monte. Like the one time, all of the action that has been building up from this game, he's like, I gotta get in there. And I like that they just immediately engage when Dig goes into the river. Like they give him no chance whatsoever to linger around, which is cool to see. But, you know, there was just a lot more play. So this one just did not stick in my mind because we had seen too many of these flanks too much throughout action the to game. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, now bear with me, guys. I know we've been, you know, we've been watching these highlights for like a full 24 seconds, but uh, just a couple more to come. I promise, it's over soon. <laughs> I'm, I'm over, overstimulated, James. <laughs> I know, right? There's just too much action all around the map. Uh, I, I will say, like, I don't blame Golden Guardians. You know, they have a bunch of naturally winning lanes. They had. Uh, you know, a 25 CS lead in their top lane. They had a 5K gold lead before that Baron or Dragon fight even happened. So, like, I don't blame them necessarily. I think yep. a, a stronger team probably could have blown Dignitas out of the water faster. Right. But, you know, if you're going to win 100% playing that way and you're a struggling team and you're below 500, I understand that. Yeah, approach. you're right. Okay, you heard it here first, ladies and gents. Mark Z does not blame Golden Guardians <laughs> for their own victory. <laughs> I meant for the pace of the game, James. I don't blame them for the pace of the game. Oh, they got every dragon. They got every hero. They're Not crushing CS yeah. deficits. So like, yeah. They're just There's waiting for the enemy to show up. It's like they keep poking at someone. It's like, are, is there somebody there? Like, we're not too sure, but okay, I guess we'll take it. Yeah, Dude, they couldn't even force them. At one point, Closer is taking a herald while dragon spawns. And once the herald is dead, the dragon's alive. And then Dignitas just runs away from the dragon. So this guy solos the herald with dragon spawning yeah. and makes it to dragon before the other team takes it so it's like <laughs> yeah dignitas just didn't want to leave their towers the towers are nice and cozy and warm so they yeah, just you ever fought a there. dragon probably it's a scary endeavor my friend all right <laughs> anyway <laughs> let's talk about a player who that we've actually been really impressed by so far in summer split and i feel we haven't necessarily given him his due in terms of that time and acknowledging a fbi for golden guardians is playing the top tier league of legends yeah, he's been uh, crushing the bot lane. I think statistically, if you go down, he probably has the best on paper resume this split uh, for laning phase. He's been dominating. Uh, he's been doing it pretty quietly. I feel like there's so, so much conversation around closer. And if Demonte is working well around him and some of the mistakes that happen in the later game uh, that have happened, excuse me, with with uh, 
who he, but individually, he has been so good. He's gotten them a ton of gold advantages over the course of, of this split and can be relied on no matter what the matchup is to almost always be ahead. Damage per minute taking a hit from this game. You can see there on the oh, right no. side, but that's due to the inaction. That's Dignitas victory right there. I <laughs> on Ezreal, yeah. too. I think oh, the no. things you love to see, right, is that CSD being extended even more, the gold differential being positive, and even his damage share, while the damage per minute being low, it still seems to sync with what his role is on the team. He is a, you know, a high damage dealer for this. Wait. Team. It's How percentage. Much damage happened it's percentage. This game. It's percentage. If, if he did 33% yeah. of the damage oh. and there's only 200 damage done. Okay. Per I, minute. Know, I know why. Per minute. I know why. Oh, yeah. minute. Okay, it's yeah, because, wait a minute. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> his total damage of the game, Mark. Oh, it God. was his old. <laughs> like, was there less than 1,000 damage? He was damage using that game? true shot barrage like all the time and it hit multiple members. So that's how he kept the numbers up. There you go. Yeah. There you go. All right. All right. That was a good laugh to close out the day. This week's <laughs> MasterCard Player of the Week goes to a star who stepped up big time in a huge week for the rising Team Liquid. It goes to TL's Core JJ. Core JJ Yay. has been <laughs> so good. Sorry, we have to energize ourselves again. His bar this weekend was absolutely disgusting. I know a lot of people are looking at the vision score, and I see some people saying, oh, Zombie War was inflating that. But even accounting for Zombie Ward and Bard's usual roam-heavy playstyle, he's still outpacing other people who are able to use those. If that wasn't impressive enough, his ability to constantly stipe out Poom to start fights and kill people, like even though Jensen had a lot of the kills, those were often off the back of Core JJ's play. It's going to be so powerful for them moving forward into playoffs when they have a bard that needs to be addressed in the ban phase because not a lot of other teams are able to pick this champion up and it can definitely be taken in the first few rotations. And if you do, you know what you're getting out of Core JJ. Incredible play out of him this week and with it. So moving forward, teams have to either pick it up or suffer a disadvantage in the draft when they face Team Liquid. A world champion and former LCS MVP finding his form at the end of week six is a scary thing for the other teams in the LCS. Now, MasterCard is collaborating with the LCS to award lucky fans with a couple of personalized experiences. One winner will get to play and learn with free from the comfort of their own home, and five other participants get a Q&A session with yours truly. All you have to do is use and save your MasterCard in the league client. The contest runs till July 19th. That's today, by the way, in case you were wondering, July uh -oh. 19th. So you're running out of time. Get in there last minute. For more information, check out the full article on lollysports.com. As we wrap up the weekend, though, let's take a look at the Samsung SSD Fast 5 leaderboards to close things out. There had, uh, rather, there were two new lap times to join the leaderboards this week, the first of which comes from Sven in the bot lane, with a fr uh, first with a lap time of 20.32. That's to 10K gold. And then Huhi, first to the uh, lap time of 8.41, as you can see there on his item upgrade. Let's talk ADCs, because I love the, the seconds that are being taken off these laps to see how quickly teams can accelerate their bot laners. Oh, wow, I mean, I think a big part of it, you, you're actually hitting these thresholds, not just farming, you have to be involved in fights, and right. that is what happened in the Cloud9 game. Sven was able to get quite a few early skirmishes going his way, which turned into him being able to farm, and even when you thought you shoved him out of lane, he'd be able to stick around, somebody helps him out, and cashes in on all those waves. It's also not even a bad, like, tier list. If you're going to go, who are the best players in the... 80 carry position this split. You'd be like, okay, yeah, Zven, Tactical, Double F, sure, Bang, Actually, Johnson. Yeah, they're all top five, you know. You know what's interesting? The top four laps are the top four teams in the exact order dun, that dun, they come, essentially. It's Cloud9, Team Liquid, then TSM, then Evil Geniuses. Those are the team rankings as well. So it, there seems to be some amount of coincidence in, in that case. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious, can anyone get under that 20 mark? As you called out, Crumbs, I think it's going to rely on a lot of heavy early game fighting for uh, some of these new times to get beaten. Yeah, I mean, I got to say, like, most of these teams are not playing, like, a bot-centric, like, meta at all. Even though I know it's not a bot-centric meta, we usually see one team at least is, like, you know, really loves hugging that bot river. But none of these teams are really playing that way. So if we do get into a game where we have some, like, volatile bot lanes and they want to fight, that number is going to go way down as soon as we get more kills in the bot lane. Let's pull up the standings, take a look at where the teams stand coming out of week six. Three weeks to go, Cloud9, Team Liquid stand atop the table, 10 and 2 for each of them. A lot of separation now between them and the rest of the team. So they're sitting pretty pretty uh, here with the final three weeks around the corner. On the flip side, though, that means it's anyone's game when it comes to playoff picture. Remember, top eight make it to playoffs, so only two will miss. And with one game between Dignitas Immortals and 100 Thieves, it's really, it's really anyone's ballgame.
I feel like EG could be a dark horse here since they just beat C9, which counts for a lot since they looked really good doing it. And it's a new roster. We're like, okay, what are they going to bring to the table? We already know they can have completely terrible drafts or actually beat Cloud9. So if they can just go more towards the beat Cloud9 side, they could easily cement themselves onto that third place spot since the competition looks shaky. Yeah, I want to take a look at uh, one player as well who reached a pretty significant career milestone this week. Wild Turtle hit his 1500th regular season kill, a milestone that only Doublelift and himself can claim. This deserves to be celebrated even despite the results of FlyQuest matches this weekend. Re Congratulations to Wild Turtle, and welcome back to the LCS, my friend. Pressuring this turret here. Power of Evil's around, so yeah. they got to be careful. Blabber has no flash. He might just oh. be dead. Yep, Blabber tries to get out, but it will not work. And there we go, sound the horn. Brr, 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 brr. Wild Turtle, 1,500 regular season kills with a mystic shot into Mr. Uwu Ears himself. Set is out of there, <laughs> and Turtle's holding the trophy. I got to say, I, th I think we should replace uh, the actual air horn with, with Captain Flowers. So that was yeah. uh, quite the celebration, Turtle. I hope he finds another milestone soon so we can get some more Captain Flowers hype. We'll have, yeah, we'll, we're ke keeping track of all of the players' career milestones, so while Turtle might have some time before he hits that 2K mark for another celebration. No, I'm we'll sure he's next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got one today. He's getting 500 next week. Uh, but really solid job, Wild Turtle. It's been an absolute joy to follow your career uh, as it has spanned quite some time here in the LCS. The LCS returns next Friday with Evil Geniuses versus Immortals to kick things off and Team Liquid versus FlyQuest shortly after that. Important note, we've got Team Liquid versus C9 on Sunday. So that's a battle for first place between those two teams. Mark it off on your calendar. If you can't wait till Friday, don't worry. Tune into the dive, this or that, Academy Rush, and more for LCS action all week long. That's going to do it for us here, though, on the LCS. Now, on behalf of myself, the casters, the entire remote broadcast crew, thank you for watching, and we'll see you over on twitch.tv slash Bud Light for the Bud Light League Lounge. Good night. Good night.